my name is Mark McDonald. I'm a data engineer at a car insurance startup called ClearCover. And I am joined by uh, my colleague, Kevin Sanchez, who is ClearCover's analytics uh, engineering manager. Uh, and he's really the, the real DBT guru at our company. So uh, the talk today is titled Efficient and Effective CI-CD for DBT. There's going to be a real heavy emphasis on the CI part. Um, and if you don't know what CI-CD is, no worries. I'll introduce you to it. Um, and then finally, before we start, I, I apologize in advance for uh, any barking on my dog's behalf. So bear with me on that. Um, let's see. A uh, quick uh, agenda. Hopefully you can see this slide. Um, I'm going to introduce you to what we do at ClearCover, and then we will talk a little bit about our data stack, and Kevin will uh, share with you how we use DBT. Uh, and then at that point, we're going to do a deep dive into CICD, and uh, we'll talk about a big refactoring that we made to our CI process for DBT. And uh, it's something that's really working out and that we've benefited from, so hopefully we can pass it on to you. And there should be plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So uh, looking at this slide here, you can see our data stack. Um, these are you know, the tools that, that comprise what we use at ClearCover. Um, probably nothing too surprising to this audience. Um, oops, actually, sorry, I want to go back one slide. I just want to talk about ClearCover real quick. Um, so we are a car insurance startup geared towards helping the most amount of people pay less for better coverage. Uh, we are a four-year-old company. We've got about 166 employees. We sell our insurance through a number of, uh, of channels, through um, folks like independent agents and through partnerships with websites like The Zebra and Compare.com. Uh, and we're headquartered in Chicago, where I'm located right now, as is Kevin. Um, but even, even before COVID, we actually had a, a significant minority of the company that works remotely. Um, so to date, we've raised over $100 million, and we, our, our product is live in eight states. Um, we're adding more this year. So uh, check us out. We, we may be able to save you some money on, uh, on what you're paying for car insurance. Quick look at our, our data stack. Um, you can see here that we've got uh, pretty standard tooling that you all are, are probably familiar with or have heard of before. Uh, the one tool here that you may be unfamiliar with is Prefect. Uh, this is a data workflow open source software package. It's sort of similar to a Luigi or Airflow, but uh, I think of it as like more modern. So rather than running on a single, um, uh, single node like an EC2 instance, uh, your flows or DAGs get executed uh, in Kubernetes or on a AWS Fargate. So we're big fans of Prefect and would encourage you to check them out if you were looking for some sort of solution to um, execute your DAGs. They actually have a similar business model to DBT at the moment in that their core software is open source, but they have a cloud offering um, that is paid that allows you to manage and execute uh, your flows. So we, we at ClearCover are customers of, of Prefect Cloud. Um, now I'll turn it over to Kevin, who is going to talk to us about DBT at ClearCover. Uh, yep. Yeah. So here at ClearCover, we have we have I think a couple of DBT projects, but our main uh, like analytics project is about 800 models. I want to say five to 600 of those are actually materialized either as a view or a table. Um, we're pulling about 27 data sources from either five chan or stuff that Mark's team has built. Um, we uh, we make sure every model is tested at least with one test, which is you know kind of bare minimum. But like a model won't get added to the project without at least one test. Uh, we I know this has kind of been debated a lot in the DBT channel, in the DBT Slack. We decided to go with one scheme, like one YAML file per model, just it makes it more obvious, you know, uh, what's tested, what isn't, um, and then we have about 10 active contributors um, on my team. So, you know, people are submitting PRs from every, a bunch of different pods um, and everyone has a say. Uh, anyone can submit to our branch. You just need one 
for request review and approval. Uh, we all, you know, last year decided to spend an absurd amount of time writing a style guide. So all the code looks consistent uh, and all the commas are in the same place across every model. Uh, and uh, we wrote a GitHub temp, uh, pull request template just to kind of speed up when you submit a PR. Uh, the reviewer shouldn't kind of spend a ton of time asking what that PR is about. So it's a pretty extensive uh, template. And if you don't use one, I recommend Googling it um, or searching the Slack. It's really, it's really sweet as someone that reviews a ton of PRs. Um, and then we also run a blue green deployment here, but because of certain requirements where some things can't move, we actually do uh, schema swaps across databases. Um, so what that lets us do is, you know, some schemas are written and there's downtime for those specific schemas that are shared as Snowflake data shares, but uh, there's a bunch of other schemas where we deploy them into a staging database and swap them uh, at runtime. Um, and given DBT's, one of DBT's latest updates, uh, we can do the unqualified object names. So it lets us have views. Um, I know it's a big issue with blue green deployments where if you decide to swap databases or schemas, you end up losing views. Uh, so know that you can do that. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, before we move to blue green deployments, you know, if there was a bug and it, so we run our project once a day in the morning. Um, oh, sorry to, to interrupt. Can you repeat that? I didn't quite get what, what you were saying there. Uh, sorry, the view part or the unqualified uh, name? The, the uh, the unqualified name. What, what what's that? Sure. So uh, when you when you deploy a view in DBT, right? It's pointed to a date. Uh, a date. Any references in that view are pointed to a database schema and an, an object name. Uh, so if you do that and then you swap it, uh, you might actually break the references if you if you get rid of your staging environment, right? Because all the view references are going to be pointed to the stage. So what you can do is have DBT write all those references without the database. So it actually writes, you know, like select star from, and it's just schema dot object. So that when you swap it, those references remain valid in your new database. Um, I think this, this was added in dbt.16, I think. Um, so I recommend the, that change log. Um, I, I, I apologize. Uh, oh, Claire, what's, what's the name of the feature again? I just want to write it down because I did, I still can't follow. Yeah, I, um, I'll there. put it in the chat in just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that's 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 what our project looks like uh, now. We we have like just about two thousand tests on these models, but ideally we'd have a test on every column. Um, so that's a growth opportunity. I'm sure most people here are familiar with. Uh, but Mark, back to you. Cool. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, this is a quick look at how we run DBT in production. So I alluded to it earlier, um, we're using this tool called Prefect, but it, it would look quite similar if we were doing this in Airflow. Um, the workflow gets executed as a DAG. So uh, this, this diagram here is really a stripped down simplified version of what our production flow looks like, but it hits all the major points. So step one is we pull down secrets from an encrypted uh, data store uh, and those secrets populate our profiles.yaml file. And then uh, we perform some raw data freshness checks just to make sure that, you know, upstream pipelines have actually done their job and populated the raw data so that when we do DBT run, it's going to be worthwhile. Um, if those checks fail, we, we send Slack alerts to the appropriate people and we just stop the workflow. Uh, but assuming everything is, uh, is fresh, we go ahead and do a DBT run uh, and then followed by a DBT test if tests have failed. Slack alerts get sent out to the appropriate people. And then finally, we deploy uh, DBT docs website to a static S3 site. Um, and that's it. That's like, in a nutshell, what our production flow looks like. Um, but as you can imagine, like all, most of these nodes in this graph really don't change all that much. But the DBT project is always being iterated on. Every day, there's new commits going into it. Um, so this is like, uh, in terms of, you know, bang for your buck in terms of what you want to test. This is where 
we really focus our testing of this of this production workflow. So now, uh, at a high level, let's talk about CI/CD. So CI is this philosophy that uh, preaches implementing small code changes to be checked into you know GitHub or your version control system frequently. Ideally, you're doing that. You and your team are doing that a couple times a day. You keep those changes small, and the advantage in doing that is when there are bugs discovered in production, which which happens. Um, you ideally don't have to roll back a ton of commits. You're just going back uh, a short ways. And then the biggest benefit is uh, you have automation in place to test and package your code before it gets deployed into a new environment. So that's what CI is. CD is the second part of the automation, which is how you deliver that packaged and tested code into an environment like UAT in production. Um, so at the bottom of this slide, you'll see uh, four very popular CI CD tools, uh, Circle CI, CodeShift, GitLab, and uh, CodeBuild. Um, at ClearCover, we use CodeShift and we also use CodeBuild, uh, not simultaneously. It sort of depends on which project we're working on, um, if time permits. So for this project, for our DVT projects, we chose AWS CodeBuild, and I'd, I'd be happy to discuss why we chose that over CodeShift. Um, one thing to note about these tools is that they are hosted SaaS offerings. And so by design, any DVT command that you're going to want to call in your CI process is going to need to be able to connect to your warehouse, assuming you're using like a cloud data warehouse, like a Snowflake or a BigQuery or Redshift, because um, DVT needs to gather some metadata to execute those commands. So uh, Assuming you have a network policy in place on that cloud data warehouse, you're going to have to whitelist the IP addresses of these um, third party tools uh, to be able to access your Snowflake instance or your BigQuery instance or whatever. Um, so just something to be aware of and maybe something you would want to talk to your security team about before you, uh, you know, go down this path and choosing one of these tools. Um, but let's talk now about specific CI strategies for DBT. So I'm going to talk about sort of two ends of the spectrum that I can think of. Um, so you could have a very inexpensive CI testing process that just runs a DBT compile. Um, and, you know, again, the whole point here of running CI and running a build is that um, you want some of your tests to run prior to promoting your code. And hopefully those tests uh, give you the confidence of that what you're promoting to UAT in production is valid working code. Um, so this quick and easy inexpensive build of just running dbt compile is great because like you're doing something, it doesn't take a whole lot to do. Um, it's fast, it's inexpensive, but the big downside to it is that you haven't run any of your dbt tests you don't know that things like permissions are going to work correctly. And so there's some major gaps in just doing a DBT compile in your CI process. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, you could do a full DBT run and a full DBT test prior to promoting your code. Now, as you can imagine, this is like really expensive. It takes time, it takes compute resources. And depending on the size of your team, uh, if you were to do this every time someone wants to propose a code change, it's, it's clearly not going to scale very well. Um, but the benefit here is that you know you can be very confident that what you're going to put in the UAT and what you're going to put in production is going to work as you expect it to. So the question is, you know, is there some happy medium between these two ends of the spectrum? And the spoiler alert is yes, there is. And this is something that Kevin and I discovered on a recent project that we were preparing on. Um, so this diagram here that you can see, version one of our CI/CD process, um, this is what we've been doing for quite some time. I think since I joined ClearCover, this, this was our process. And you can see it split into three parts here. So we have the build, which is you know, more or less synonymous <clears throat> with CI. And then you have the two phases of deployment, deploying to UAT and deploying to prod. Um, and the process works like this. So an analytics engineer has changes that they want to make to a DBT model. So they commit that in GitHub and they open a pull request. And that pull request then triggers a build script that kicks off 
in, in our case in AWS code build. And what that build script is doing is it's actually doing a full run of dbt run and dbt test. And then once that completes, hopefully successfully, you know, a little green check mark appears in GitHub and another analytics engineer who's been asked to review this PR knows, okay, the, the code looks good to me and I can see that it was run in this um, CI environment. So I feel pretty good about approving this. And then at that point, uh, the analytics engineer merges those code changes into the master branch of that GitHub repo. Uh, at this point, that kicks off another uh, job in AWS code build. So we call this our deployment job. And what that is doing is packaging up the dbt code, the dbt project, along with some, in our case, prefect code, and putting it into our prefect cloud UAT environment. And uh, if the engineer wants to, they can log into our UAT environment and trigger that flow to be executed. And at that point, the full flow uh, runs. So not just the dbt project and dbt test, but also things like deploying the dbt docs website. Um, so at this point, if an engineer does that, they see, hey, this works end to end. They can be confident that once they put this into production, things are gonna go smoothly. So to do that, they create a release in GitHub and that triggers a similar script again in AWS code build, which is packaging up all that code and putting it into our production environment. Um, so this is what we were doing up until a few months ago. But you know what happened a few months ago is Kevin came to me and he said, hey Mark, our AWS code build has a default time setting uh, and it limits our build projects to two hours. So his team kept bumping up against this limit. So the builds were failing, not because there was problems with the code, but just because AWS code build has this default time limit. So I thought to myself, well, yeah, we can just increase the threshold. That's not a problem. But this was raising some red flags. And so Kevin and I started digging into this problem and pinpointing why it was so efficient. And you know what we realized is that as our company has grown, our BI team has grown, and their DBT project has grown, so each PR doing a full run of a pretty big DBT project executed on the same Snowflake warehouse was just not scaling very well. So the easy solution would have been we just throw money at it, right? We could just increase the horizontal scaling of the DBT Snowflake warehouse uh, but you probably agree that throwing money at a problem like this is rarely the optimal solution. Uh, so we brainstormed and this is the solution that we came up with. Um, you'll notice that the right uh, hand side of this flow hasn't changed. So we really didn't touch how we deploy our projects, um, but the left has some major refactoring to it. So what's going on here? Well. Um, the first step is when a pull request gets open, it triggers this new code build job. And this build script is first reaching out to GitHub's API and it's querying its pull request endpoint. And what it's doing is it's asking GitHub, okay, within this pull request, what files exactly have changed? And from that, we know what models, what DBT models have changed. And so what we realized is we can just run a dbt run of those models and a dbt test of those models, as well as their downstream dependencies. And we can have the same amount of confidence that when we promote this code into UAT or production, that things are gonna work. Uh, but the one catch is that we need a production-like environment to run this test. So to do this, we use Snowflake's uh, zero copy clone feature to clone our production analytics database. And this is just a temporary database that as soon as we're done with this testing, we drop. And so uh, this is Python code. This is basically what our build script in AWS code build looks like. And again, if you were using one of these other tools, it wouldn't look much different. Um, step one uh, that we have here is really just querying the uh, GitHub pull request endpoint. Uh, 
uh, finding out what files exactly have changed. So here in this file response variable, we get a list of those files that have changed. We iterate through that list and we find um, those files that actually pertain to DBT models. If there are other ancillary files that happen to be in the project, we don't really care about them because we're not going to test those files. Um, and we do a little bit of uh, manipulation to um, take the file name and turn it into the model name just by stripping out things like .sql. Um, at this point, we now know the models that have been changed or that are brand new. And so we, uh, in step two here, we're building up a custom bash script that will uh, actually execute these models and their downstream dependencies. So this is just some string manipulation. And uh, what's going to happen here is when this gets executed, it will run dbt dependencies. Uh, it will run dbt run for this select group of models and dbt test for that same select group of models as well as their downstream dependencies. And the way that you indicate that it should run the downstream dependencies is based on this uh, plus sign to the right of each model name. We write that to this bash script called dbt commands.sh. And then step three is just a very simple clone of our production database. And then step four, which is off the screen here, is just literally executing this bash script that we had created in step two. Um, and the results have been great. So, you know, Kevin can speak to this as it really impacts him and his team, but we've seen huge reductions in the build times. We've gone from anywhere between like an hour and a half to a three hour build before this change down to say 20 minutes. And about 10 of those minutes are just executing the DBT clone of the production database. And then the other benefit to this, which our management really appreciates, obviously, is we're burning a lot fewer uh, compute resources um, unnecessarily. So we saw a 40% reduction in Snowflake compute burn month over month from when we made this change. Um, but the most important thing is that even though we're saving time and money, you know, our team still has the confidence at what we're promoting to UAT and to production uh, because of the code changes has been run and tested in a production-like environment, and they can rest easy knowing that uh, these things are gonna work once they're, once they're in production. So with that, um, thank you. And uh, I think now we have time for a Q and A. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you have a question, feel free to um, pop it in the chat. Um, I'm gonna start us off. Um, what were some things that were maybe more complex about this project than you'd initially anticipated, or was it a bit of a home run? Kevin, do you want to take that one or should I? I guess I'll grab that one. Um, I think uh, in terms of errors that we ran into, uh, thinking back on the project, it was really just like getting the permissionings all sorted out. So you're taking a clone of your production database and um, we are using a different user and a different role to uh, you know, execute these DBT runs and DBT tests. So we ran into a couple of hiccups there when we we're deploying this change. Um, the other thing was, I guess, I had some doubts initially just about the uncertainty of doing this snowflake uh, cloning and dropping of databases. Like, I, it's something I hadn't seen anyone else do so uh, rapidly. Like, every day we're, we're spinning up new databases and dropping them. Um, we do that for every single PR. Uh, but obviously, Snowflake scales really well and, and can handle that um, volume. So. That, that hasn't been an issue. Kevin, do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I, I, I remember a lot of the complexity was also because I decided to rewrite the, our blue-green deployment code uh, at the same time. Uh, right. and, while, while, and so that runs in prod and UAT, but our, these code build jobs run in a dev environment and we explicitly needed it to not do any swapping in the dev environment. Uh, so the complexity was basically having uh, 
to figure out how to do that, which we eventually did, but it was brutal. <laughs> Fair enough. Cool. Um, I'm just going to go through the list here. So Mario, are you available to ask your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask about how do you handle DDL changes? So when you have to run the full refreshes, how do you handle in this in the CI CD pipeline? Yeah, so uh, we... just a note, sorry, just a note, I, I missed first 10 minutes of the meeting. So maybe you cover this. So sorry in advance. Yeah, so we do have incremental models in our project, but uh, when we do the dev, these, these code build jobs, uh, we do run them always with a full refresh. Um, just because it's it's not possible for the analysts at runtime to kind of pass that parameter when they're creating their pull requests, right? So, um, and the the models that are incremental, we so seldom touch those because they're just massive and, and they generally don't make that many changes to them. That it's not that much of an issue. Um, but when we do, we'd be running those as a full refresh. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a really valid idea, like a really valid response to do it always as a full refresh. I think some other cool things just to like add my two cents here. Um, you can actually use like the dbt ls function or list function um, with a JSON output, which would give you like all the, and then the selector arguments and you could parse that output to figure out which ones are, are incremental. So if any of your chain, your models of uh, are incremental, but I guess, no, I'm, as, uh, as soon as I said this out loud, I realized it was a bad idea because if the model has changed, it would appear in that GitHub list anyway. So yeah, okay, ignore me. Uh, anyway, continuing on, uh, <laughs> Corey, would you like to um, ask your question out loud? Sure. Why did you choose AWS code build over something like GitHub Actions? Yeah, um, so good question. The Code build was already in place. So the way the way we've set up Prefect is we are um, we're trying to make a self service platform for anyone at our company who who knows a bit of Python to write uh, a data workflow. And so the reason why AWS Code Build lends itself to working well in that kind of self service fashion is um, it AWS has great uh, support for a language called Terraform. Terraform allows us to write infrastructure as code. Uh, so each team for each uh, repository that they have gets their own dedicated AWS code build uh, build project. And so um, there's probably Terraform uh, options for, for some of these other tools, but um, AWS is kind of like a, a shining star uh, client of, of Terraform. Um, so we knew that it was going to work really well uh, to use code build rather than something like Circle CI, and we didn't even consider GitHub Actions to be honest. Uh, and, and a lot of this stuff was in place before we, we took on this particular project. Thank you. Yep. Um, Niall. Oh no, sorry, Bastian. Sorry, I'm trying to just go through them uh, in order. Uh, yeah, cool. I uh, really like the presentation, by the way. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I had like, so yeah, my question was, uh, if you had uh, thought about potentially, like, because when you were, one of the things you were saying is you kind of run like up and downstream dependencies. So like, that can potentially sometimes be quite a few models. Uh, and sometimes probably, maybe sometimes you don't need both of the sides to be run or, or all of the models that are upstream or downstream. Um, and I'm just curious, actually, because one of the things like we do, so we, we don't like do the, the blue green before, so we just like deploy on master and, and uh, with a sort of like tool. But one of the things we do is because like our uh, data model has like, you know, dims and facts, uh, and it's like the way we name the models. Um, we kind of have like some weird rules, but it kind of works most of the time where if like if we have like a view, we just refresh the view, and um, because we don't really need to like yeah run anything before and after. And like if it's a dimension, we run up and downstream. And if it's a fact, we just run uh, the fact uh, 
downstreams, I think, or something like that. Some kind of rules that like, you know, you probably don't need the whole chain. Um, I was curious if you thought about this, if it, if you run into pickles, because we, I think we do sometimes. Um, so it just kind of, or maybe you just, you don't have a model that you can kind of automatically parse, or that's a fact, or that's a dim, and then that's an apply. Uh, yeah, so we, so we only run downstream dependencies uh, of every model. Um, and that is, that we're allowed to do that from the fact that we, we do a prod copy of the database, right? So we don't necessarily need to test upstream. So, and we only do the downstream ones. Uh, we, we also like, and this is mostly on me, and we haven't designed our data model as cleanly as uh, nice dins and facts that, that would lend itself well to that process. Um, but uh, that, is, that is clever for how you approach that. But I think like for now, we just run all the downstream dependencies and, and uh, it's, it's not that big of an issue. Um, right. right. Like our, our test builds run, I mean, they take 20 minutes, but looking at the logs, it's like 12 minutes to do the, the copy. So eight minutes for each one is, is not that bad, especially because people used to basically do them during breakfast and, and check back basically at lunchtime. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, yeah, I guess. Yeah, the clone is not some, yeah, so that makes sense actually. Uh, cool, thanks. Um, I'm just working through them in the right order. So Niall, are you? Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm Niall. Um, I'm wondering how you've structured your DBC project to, to enable this kind of downstream running um, and to reduce the, the build time so much. What, do you have a particular kind of modeling structure that you use? Similar to the last question. Yeah, so we... Uh, uh, so the, the way we're able to get the quicker downstream runs is really because the majority of, so the way we structure our project is we have source models, right? That, that basically just clean up the data, the, like the base models that I think DBT preaches. So we have that, and then we have a, a, a transform layer uh, before a data warehouse layer, which then uh, at the end has a reporting layer. Most of the reporting layer are views. Um, and so like those clearly, they, they take a second to deploy. Um, the, and generally when people make changes, each PR tends to, there's not that many people touching the source models, right? Like if you're, if you're touching those base models, like you're kind of screwed. Uh, and we definitely haven't gotten around that. Um, but it's a bigger issue if you have 10 people making changes to those source models daily. Um, what tends to happen is when we make changes to those models, they're made in big batches as refactors. Uh, most of the changes tend to happen between the transform layer and the reporting layer. Um, and like when we look at our DAG, we've designed it to have certain bottlenecks everywhere just for data consistency sake. So sometimes you just can't get around certain bottlenecks where uh, like if, if we do a full refresh of, of one of our primary tables, that table takes 20 minutes. And like, even if you do 30, uh, 30 threads, right? Like you're just waiting for that one to finish because everything is dependent on that. And there's, yeah. there's really no way of getting around that for us. Um, okay, cool. And have you always maintained a really kind of strict structure or has it been something that you've kind of improved on over time? And if so, how have you, how have you worked with the analysts to get them to follow it? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, for that, we've definitely consistently changed the structure. Um, I think the last time we changed it, uh, so before the pandemic, you know, we sat next to each other uh, okay. and people were complaining about an inability to refer to certain models given the current structure. So we literally like got on the window and just drew up a new structure. And then we kind of just like went around the room and it's like, like, I know this is complicated, but like, are you in, are you in, are you in? And so what we ended up creating were, uh, so instead of just having base models, we have uh, in, in the world where you would want to reference a certain model uh, in the same level, right? So if you have all in, in, within base models, you shouldn't refer to other base models. Yeah. Um, but a lot of our source system data is kind of crappy uh, in that like you would want a couple more, like I don't want to have to join a states table to get the actual state abbreviation. So we ended up creating a layer just before that where all the, all the cleaning happens in a, a pre-base level. 
and then you're able to reference pre-base models within base models, but you can't reference within the same hierarchy. Um, cool. And we keep those hierarchies structured in the folder structure so that when we hire new people, it's basically like you just, you can't uh, reference things within the same folder. And I know sometimes like you can get away with it. And I'm sure people in this room have not gone away with it. And you run a DBT and it says there's a circular reference. Um, so we've gotten through that by just creating folder structures for each layer. Um, and frankly, it's like 12 layers at this point and it's fairly complicated, but for most people that have worked on complicated projects, you, you get to the point where like, it's kind of necessary. Sure, great. That was a great answer, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna follow up on that. Sorry, Jason, I did give you the go ahead <laughs> to ask your question, but I, was, I just wanted to launch off this one. Um, when you got all the buy-in and, and you, I remember in your presentation earlier, you said you wrote a style guide. Um, do you just enforce it by saying like in the PR checklist, like, yes, I followed the style guide, which is like something that, that we tend to do, or do you have mechanisms to like enforce that style guide? Uh, so we are lucky to have some very, very stickler people on this team. One that's sitting pretty close to me right now. Uh, and so what helps first with, with, with how, um, it's kind of appreciated is we spent weeks kind of like not yelling at each other, but like arguing about what mattered and whether to have inner, whether to like actually write inner join instead of just join, right? Like those kinds of debates happened for weeks and everyone contributed to, to our code cell. So that, that helps a little bit. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time uh, making changes to SQL fluff uh, to make it so that we don't have to do it manually anymore but it's brutal and the SQL fluff linter is still really, uh, really young, let's say. Makes um, sense but a, is a nice way yeah. to say it. Yeah, uh, cool. But, um, yeah, I mean, having the conventions is the, is the first step, I guess. Yeah, I do recommend SQL fluff for anyone that hasn't seen it. Um, I think Claire has posted about it in, in the DVD Slack. If you're willing to change your code style, it's really nice. Um, all right. Uh, hey, Kevin, it's Jason. Uh, something we run into a lot is we have some important tests in place where occasionally we'll see a few failures uh, due to usually like an issue with the ETL. Uh, is that something you, you see in your build process and does that hold things up? So, uh, so what kind of issues specifically? Like, like not necessarily an actual issue in the source data, but rather an issue in the the process uh, of getting that source data? So I guess let's say you have a, a uniqueness test on, on one of your models and that fails for some reason and usually it happens, there's an issue with the ETL. Uh, I think with your build pipeline, you would, would get a failure on one of your tests potentially holding things up. Is that something yep. that happens? Yep, that's real. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so Mark's team writes uh, data quality tests on their ingestion pipelines, but we, so we don't actually write tests against source models. And we, so we write those tests on all the models kind of thereafter. Uh, and we do write them on our base models. The, the thing about how we do things is uh, we put a lot of dedupes in places that don't need them uh, just because there's plenty of people on this team that have been like scarred from working in really crappy environments where it's just like, I don't want to wake up to having to fix something at five in the morning. Uh, so we over dedo things, which likely slows down a lot of our jobs, but uh, yeah, like we, there are, there's issues in our source data that like, like it's not an ETL issue, the source data is just shitty. Um, and so we, there's a blog post in, in the DBT blog couple, I think a couple months ago, um, and I've been doing this for a couple of years, we, we have transform objects, sorry, uh, exclusion objects and override objects. So we manage all of our overrides and exclusions in like two model sets. And then we actually just override or exclude things in each model. Uh, and we exclude certain primary keys or we exclude whatever. And we union all that stuff together into big transform and big exclusion models. So we like, we carry a ton of code to exclude crappy source data but I think most people do anyway. So what we did is we just made sure it's all in the same place. So all of our exclusions, um, we have one exclusion per source, one exclusion model per source, we union all that stuff together and then we union all the sources together. And then we join it into models to exclude stuff just to keep all that stuff in one place. So when there is a test failure, 
it's either because there's something new in the source data that needs to be cleaned and we and frankly like uh we used to have those tests and and not report the failure to prevent the code build job uh but that also meant people didn't actually care enough about updating and fixing those tests especially if it wasn't urgent to the work they were doing so not that long ago i flipped the switch and it's like hey if you want your if you want to merge your pr you're gonna to have to contribute a fix to that code or to, to that test um and it's worked yeah. nicely like we still have failures but we have two or three and not 17. and yeah just to tack on to that jason um even for a, a data source that is or a pipeline that's being managed by something like five uh my team takes like a an approach that we we tr don't trust the pipeline and we will do data quality testing uh, end to end. So we can, we always have uh, pretty much full confidence that the source and the target match. So on the extraction and loading side, there are rarely ever problems. And if there are, we know about them right away and we address them. Um, so it really, that as long as the upstream data sources, you know, your your production data in a in an RDS instance or whatever, um, it had you know has primary keys and, and is following best practices, um, you know we we have some pretty good uh, faith that what source data our our BI team is working with is uh, is going to work for them and isn't going to cause the test failures. But things happen, like like Kevin's saying. Thank you. Hey, um, this is Brian. Um, awesome presentation. Um, so I wanted to ask, I assume from the presentation that ClearCover has a monolith DBT project set up as opposed to multi-project setup. Um, and something that my company is going through now is we're considering breaking up our monolith DBT project into either projects by business unit or team or maybe system. So I was just wondering, hypothetically, do you think if you set up your DBT projects as multi-project, do you think it would have reduced the build times and compute as much as adding that final step you were talking about? And also, did you guys ever talk about um, breaking up DBT into multi-projects? Yeah, so, so we, our, we, we have two projects. Uh, so the data engineering team has one, and they write that stuff into the, the warehouse. And we, on the analytics side, reference those tables uh, as sources um, and we just make sure that that stuff gets run run first but for our actual analytics team we split a lot of our project we actually run our project in in groups when we're doing it in production using tags so we have uh, you know we have upstream we have like an upstream core job and then we have downstream jobs um, and we're able to split it up that way a little bit but we don't necessarily we did not want to deal with the complexity of having to, if you're making changes to, let's say three parts of the stack, right? Some source models and some transform stuff and then something in, in the, the reporting layer, like having to, uh, having to commit to three different repos is, sounds like kind of a pain in the ass. Um, and we didn't want to do that. Um, and I don't, I don't see us moving off from our current strategy, strategy anytime soon. Because um, yeah, we, we've just made sure to structure our job as cleanly as possible and tag it correctly or tag it extensively so that when the need arises, like we'll be able to run it in chunks. That makes sense. Hey, this is Jeff. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm a big fan of DBT tests, but haven't really integrated it into uh, workflow. Um, so. I saw, I really like the diagram that you uh, provided for what you're doing at ClearCover. I was wondering if there are resources, or, and, and this probably goes beyond just prefect, but um, how you integrated in the output of dbt test um, with either Slack uh, notifications or just killing the job entirely. Yeah. Well, so, so basically, um, what happens when a dbt test fails uh, is um, a non-zero exit code is being raised. And so in Prefect or in Airflow, that means that that task is going to fail. Um, and, and if you're not familiar with non-zero exit codes, th this is a bash concept. Um, but what happens is when that task fails, 
uh, we have another downstream task from that that goes and sees that that task failed and then finds the run results.json file that gets uh, generated by dbt. And we basically just parse through that file and find the exact test that failed. And then we format a nice message and, and send that over the Slack API to the appropriate team. Yeah, and when we we're building this, uh, I made the decision that we wouldn't actually stop the blue green plot process for a test, test failure, mainly because uh, frankly, the scale of the, of the test failures we have now are less problematic than would be not having data in the morning. Uh, and like, not ideal, uh, but we, we don't like we we have the conversation and this process actually serves itself really lends itself really nicely to move some stuff around in the prefect flow and just say like if it's a failure just don't swap it because the swap we actually i wrote the swap as a dbt run operation so you'd basically just like not do that part of it um, but for now we we don't uh we just make sure we look at the run results um it's the the run results uh that slack message gets sent into our team slack um, and so when we meet as a team, we kind of just split up and divvy up like who fixes what tests and, and some, we're usually never surprised by those tests. And when we are, that's when we actually fix them really quickly and, and rerun the job in the morning when everyone's up. Um, but, uh, that happened. Yeah. Like we're not in a place where we've basically never gone more than one day without a single test failure. Um, so and we've invested, you know, four or five hour work sessions where we go from 40 test failing to zero. And the next morning, the source data in the actual data is just kind of shitty and it creates a real error. And it's like, can't even, can't even win one. Um, so I think that's likely a maturity thing. And when our, when our, cause most of our source data comes from internal build systems and we're rapidly developing systems as well. So like sometimes there's just crappy data in there. Cool, very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, question, Josh Andrews here. Uh, how often are your data issues due to, you know, oh, someone entered a null and there shouldn't be, or that's not in our accepted lit values list versus how often are the data issues like more fundamental schema changes? Like they altered the grain of the table or altered I mean, if you even have primary keys in some of your source systems, they altered that or they altered data types or like schema versus just data changes. Yeah, most of the errors happen because we write tests. Uh, so our analytics engineers spend a lot of time reading code, like actual uh, application code from our dev teams just to make sure kind of what to expect from data. So our tests reflect those expectations. Um, so you know, there's certain rules. We write a test to make sure that rule is true. And sometimes uh, the engineering teams like break those contracts and the, the test failures are a result of those contracts being broken. Uh, which is, right. which is well, like a, it's right. essentially uh, like a surrogate key issue, right? Like if one customer is only supposed to have one active policy and for whatever reason they have two, like that's actually not supposed to happen. So that, and so we'll write a test to make sure that that relationship is unique. Um, and when it becomes not unique, like, you know, sends us an error. And then we actually tell the engineers, it's like, Hey, it seems like you guys had a release last night and something got broken. Um, and then depending on the severity, we'll write, like, we'll write the update statements for them to clean that up on their side. Um, and if they're backed up, we'll add it to our exclusion list. Got it. I, I was just wondering if you have cases where you're actually having schema drift at the source versus just like nor normal data issues. Uh, what do you mean by schema drift? Like we have a lot of issues with our incoming data where literally people will change data types on existing columns or they'll add columns to tables or they'll add new tables or they'll do other things like that that don't necessarily immediately break tests on existing data, but it's like, We've, we've literally written some models and some snapshots to try and capture schema drift on our source tables. So it flags it like, hey, you added a column and you didn't tell us. So you modified it a data type and you didn't tell us. We literally added a whole new table and you didn't tell us. And just yeah, wondering so if- We if, are 
we are both lucky and kind of screwed in that most of our data, they're just mm -hmm. JSON blobs. Like okay. the actual source data just has a primary key and a created at and an updated at, and then a huge JSONB column. Uh, so uh, the data types are all set by us, right? Like when we're pulling all that stuff out, because it's all it, it just comes back as a JSON object um, or JSON variant or whatever it is. And then, so we have written a bunch of tests to make sure that certain percent of rows aren't aren't uh, null. We've written like ubiquity tests to make to make sure that like something is a certain value most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, because what has happened is as we've kind of grown and, and changed systems or as we launch new states in our scenarios, uh, they'll just decide for one state, this value is actually just gonna be a different column because it's JSON and they don't care, right? They just write it in there. Um, and so when that happens, those tests fail and then we know that we have to uh, coalesce certain JSON uh, columns together into the same column um, because yeah, they, don't, they don't tell us when they just rename something or, or when a certain value is going to be in a different place in the JSONB object. Um, so we've are just all, written a bunch of tests. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And are all of the source systems true? Like, are they really actually NoSQL or document stores or are some of them actually real relational systems like Postgres? And it's just that they, the way you're getting the data happens to be someone put it into JSON, but, but the source is actually truly relational. No, so the so the source system itself stores it into a post like generally Postgres databases that mm -hmm. are relational, but the data within them is actually oh. it's actually JSON, yeah. right? Because it's the the application is using JSON. Um, okay. So they just kind of jump between the tables and grab whatever JSON they need. Um, so testing testing a lot of those columns uh, has become super important for us, and a lot of there's frankly just a lot of custom tests we've written there, like uh, cardinality tests and ubiquity tests and stuff that like is really obnoxious that we wouldn't have to do it if it wasn't for the JSON B structures. So it is a relational database. It's just they're not really using the relational features of it. Yeah, they're not writing. Yes, they are yeah. not actually okay. writing those features into those tables. They're only keeping the only relation. What we use those relational tables for is just to keep the relationships between the JSON objects. Got it. Okay. Um, I would not vote for this setup. <laughs> <laughs> um, Josh, I'm about to link an issue uh, in the chat. Um, one thing that we've talked about before is like adding um, a way to like validate that, like ha having a strict setting for um, schema.yaml. So like every single column uh, should be documented and it would fail if like there was a, a column that didn't have an entry in there. And I think we could also like add to that um, discussion around like doing type validation at that stage as well. So like, especially on sources, you could also have a level like, is every table documented? And that could be the first step, which is like enforcing the data structure that you expect that you have, that you're going to have before you then do anything else whatsoever. So. Yeah, there's also another ticket out there that Drew and I were talking about to say, throw a warning with snapshots if the the call the data type of the column yeah. doesn't match to the data type in the snapshot. And there are cases, yep. for example, on BigQuery where we've seen sources go from float to numeric. And because BigQuery can coerce those, it all silently works. But mm -hmm. we'd love to be warned like, hey, your source actually changed, you know. So Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh Ryan, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is kind of a, a lot of what was said is, is kind of is close to something that I've been thinking about. So, um, and, and it's kind of gets close to the, the question of, of quote unquote warnings. Um, we always have this dilemma whereby, okay, so let's say that at some point the data, um, some field that isn't supposed to be null came in from the sources with a null, right? And now what? And, and one option is, uh, let's be uh, let, let, let's just have uh, defensive code and and filter you know all all such bad records the source and then we don't get you know then nobody would wake up to, wake up up in the middle of the night uh, but then we will we would not have the visibility or the other option is oh we're going to be strict we're going we, we're going to put this test our our pipeline will fail we will be woken up but we will know and I was kind of 
working on a kind of a middle ground whereby um, I would create what I call the quality model, right? Which which basically looks for uh, which which looks for these um, uh, for, for for cases of these this field being a null, and at the same time kind of being defensive in the pipeline itself, uh, so that the pipeline will run, everything would be fine, but there will be a different channel for finding out so uh, about the problems. Does this make make sense, or has anybody kind of worked along those thought along those lines? It's a lot of silence. Um, I think something that was in the original uh, issue or feature request for like severity, like warn versus error, was actually defining a specific amount of errors that you'll allow, or even like a, a percentage based on the total rows. I think that would be, I don't know if this is the right forum for feature requests, but I think that'd be very valuable for, uh, I guess, including more tests in CICD and like allowing, let's say like three errors, errors you know historical data has. And, 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 and having some kind of handle that allows you to hook up to those non-critical errors so that they can be, you know, they can be funneled later into reports into, so you can have like qual quality data, data quality reports that are, could, could be, you know, cross organization or, or whatever. And, uh, and so, so well, anyway, I think that the point is clear. You, you want to have some kind of handling of, of bad data and, and, and monitoring and uh, alerting and whatever that doesn't cause your uh, your pipeline itself to fail. Ron, but you're saying you want something a bit more graceful, right? Where it's not just like, okay, it broke, right? Right, exactly. I, I, I don't want, want to be forced to choose between uh, having the pipeline be so brittle and having silent failures, right? Right now, right. It's, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a this either or is very extreme for me. And I want to have like a good middle ground where, okay, the pipeline can handle this. The handline is, is, is good with this kind of bad data. And yet I want the visibility. I want some, some good mechanism for visibility. I, I think that right, makes, makes a lot of sense. I'm, but I'm sorry, just gonna Claire. interrupt really quickly. Um, we're at two o'clock. So I do just want to give people an opportunity that if you, you know, it's two o'clock, you have another meeting, uh, feel free to bounce. Um, but we are very quickly going to launch a poll um, to get some feedback on this session. Um, but I'm very happy, I don't have a hard stop, so very happy to continue this conversation over the next few minutes. Um, but if you're still hanging around, if you could just take a moment to fill in this poll, um, we'd really appreciate it. Um, sorry for interrupting there, just wanted to get that out before too many people had to uh, move on to their next Zoom meeting. Um, over to you, Josh. Yeah, very good point, Claire. Um, I think, I think to Rump's point that I feel like you kind of need both approaches because you do need to have a testing approach that says, here's what we expect. And anything that is not what we expect needs to violate, like throw an error because basically you can't know what your unknown unknowns are by definition. So anything outside the box is an unknown unknown, but maybe there is, there is the category of known unknowns where there are another set of failure modes where it's like, okay, these things that I know may fail, systematically, I'd like to have a way to handle of those that it's not just like breakage, right? So I think you kind of need both because you're always going to have by definition, the set of things you don't know that you don't know. And you need to make sure that the only way to deal with that is to say like anything that I do know is this is what is acceptable and anything that's not is, is, is breakage, but there's a subcategory in there. That's probably like what you're talking about. You, you, you can take that even further. You can say, uh, okay, so let's say that some of my data I know is bad and will always be bad because at the particular period there was some, so I, I want to be able to mark that kind of error as, as known, uh, yeah. right? For, for, yeah. for the duration of two weeks in this particular month, there was a problem. So this is a known problem that we tolerate and we, are, we kind of don't even like alert on, but we still know, you know, it's, there, there's a lot of, uh, you, you can refine this, uh, you can think about this, you know, you can, you can go further down this path. Agreed. Absolutely. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, wrap this up, but uh, I'll stick around for another few minutes if anyone has any questions they want to ask. Um, but to wrap it up, I just really want to thank Kevin and Mark um, for sharing uh, this project they've worked on, sharing their time today and the, all their wisdom on all things BBT. So thank you so much for joining us.